Okay, so I was, I think this topic came about after a casual discussion with Radha and company about what thing, how can we present some different aspects of medicine. And we suggested, you know, we need to look at healthcare delivery in developing countries since we know a lot about the developed world, first world where lots of publications are made and we know what's going on. And so before I start, I've got two questions for you. The first question is, how would you classify reunion as a first world country or a developing region? It clearly depends on which social stratum you represent. So if you live amongst the poor, who have limited access to healthcare, then you are a developing region. If you live amongst the rich, in San Denis, where you can have your bypass graft, everything without a problem, then this is a first world country. And in fact, I think the problem in the world is that all of us live in different worlds within our country. And I think we need to acknowledge that. Now my second question to you, does anybody know the significance of the 1st of December? Nobody. Today is World AIDS Day. World AIDS Day. It represents the day to acknowledge one of the worst infectious disease epidemics to ever, pandemics, to ever hit the world and we haven't even noticed it yet. So it just represents, as I correctly point out, that we actually live in different worlds. And so when I was asked to give this talk, I was a bit worried because there's so much to say and also I don't know how to pitch it. So I decided to do a mix of things. And I'm going to use South Africa as a case study of healthcare delivery in developing countries. And I'd also like to sort of subtext my title to say medicine in an unjust world. And I hope that my presentation might point that out, but at least it would create some thought uh, for discussion and hopefully it's provocative. So I showed you two pictures here. The one is what we see in the majority of people in South Africa living in poor conditions, lack of access to health care, subject to the diseases of the developing world such as HIV, TB, malnutrition, all related to poverty. And then next to that, we have a different population in South Africa where the diseases are those of lifestyle, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, ischemic heart disease. And that's the kind of world I think we live in all over the world. Even in the US, 10% of the people, that's 30 million people in the US, do not have health insurance. And that's why Obamacare has created so much controversy because the rich do not want to subsidize the health care of the poor. And I think even in the UK or anywhere in the world you go, you'll see this problem. Now in the developing world, it's the other way around. The majority don't have health care and the minority do. So let me start off with two case histories. And these are two patients that came under my care, so I know it very well. So the first one is a patient who presented to me when I'm working in the private sector. Okay, so I work in the private sector and also to work in the public health institution. So this is a 38-year-old Indian woman who presented to a cardiologist with shortness of breath and chest discomfort. So whenever she walked up steps or walked fast, she not only got short of breath, but she complained of chest discomfort. Now this patient ended up in the hands of the cardiologist because her primary care physician referred her to the cardiologist. He took a history from her and obviously being Indian in South Africa, you have a strong family history of ischemic heart disease. That goes almost without asking. So the cardiologist assessed her and said, look, you know, you need a coronary angiogram. So he did a coronary angiogram and lo and behold, the coronary angiogram was normal. So the cardiologist contacted me and said, look, I got this woman who shot her breath, there's no cardiac problem, can you please see if she's got respiratory disease? So I said, fine, I'll evaluate her and I'm thinking asthma. And she's a non-smoker, so COPD was not a consideration. So I looked at her blood results and her hemoglobin was 7.8, the normal being more than 12. And it was microcytic hypochromic. So why was she short of breath? Because she was anemic. But the point I want to illustrate here is that when you present in a first world setting 
And we as doctors have many tools in our hands, we use it indiscriminately. Now the cost of treating iron deficiency anemia in euros is probably for six months, probably 50 to 100 euros at the best, most, most expensive iron tablets, okay? Mm. The cost of that coronary angiogram and the risk is like several thousand euros. So you can see that in the first world setting, how we can abuse healthcare resources. Now let's take the next patient. Now this patient I saw in the, came to me in the public, in the private sector, but from the public sector. Now let's look at this. Sorry, from the, I saw this patient in the, in the public sector. There's another patient following. This is a 54-year-old Indian man who had unstable angina. No problem, no question about it. He had ECG abnormality, he had a family history, he had hypertension, diabetes, and in fact we call that in South Africa the Indian syndrome. The Indians have ischemic heart disease, they have hypertension, diabetes, they're obese, and oftentimes they smoke, so they've got it all, the metabolic syndrome. So any Indian who walks into your room over the age of 40, you have to think about that. So from his primary care setting, in the public sector, he was referred to the tertiary cardiology department. They said, listen, you've got unstable angina, we need to put you on treatment and you need a coronary angiogram. But there was one problem. In Durban, we only have, in the whole of KwaZulu-Natal, which has a population of 10 million people, the most populous province in South Africa. South Africa is the richest country on the continent. And we've only got one angiogram facility, and that's at the tertiary hospital where the patient was referred. Now, understandably, they told him, listen, our appointments are full, we'll see you in six months and we'll do a coronary angiogram on you, and then obviously the patient may need revascularization, whether that's a stent or cabbage or whatever, will get done. But unfortunately, the patient had a massive heart attack and died one month later. So yes, the patient who needed the coronary angiogram couldn't get it because of lack of resources, and other patient who didn't need it got it because of too much resources. So I hope I'm presenting the case of health care in an unjust world, okay? Now let's look at this one. Now this patient is a mix of private sector and public sector. So this is a 17-year-old lad who got XDRTB. So he was admitted to the state facility. Now like in most countries in South Africa, TB treatment is free in the state facility. We have a dedicated facility for treating XDR-TB. So this young lad unfortunately got XDR-TB with extensive bronchiectasis. He was admitted, he was treated, but his sputum never converted. Now the hospital is full, so they discharged him. Now I got the history from the child, from the youngster and his parents. They did not advise about infection control, wearing masks, that the child was XDR-TB, still sputum positive, not responding to treatment and sent him home to die or to do what God knows. But he, because both parents are teachers, they have health insurance, out of desperation they brought him to the private sector. So the patient gets admitted to an hours on intake as a, as a post-tuberculous bronchiectasis. So you look at the x and I didn't know this whole history, the patient had clubbing, had extensive changes on examination of the chest, and the sputum is TB positive, gene expert, rifampicin resistant. So I asked, the, contacted the parents and I found out that the child got XDR-TB. So I phoned the hospital, in the state hospital where the patient was discharged from to say, how could you discharge a patient with XDR-TB who is sputum positive into the community? You do not provide any information about infection control or what the hell is going on. And they said, no, well, we'll take the patient, but we've got a waiting list of three months. So can you picture the scene? Now here is somebody who's got access to private health care. The state has a responsibility for managing the tuberculosis has been released into the community to go spread the XDR TB. And then we wonder in South Africa and in other developing countries why we have a problem. Okay. So I hope that I've created the scenario of the dilemmas and the, and the, and the, and the sort of uh, difficulties we face working in developing countries. And I don't think it's much different, except that the, the proportions are reversed. So when you look at Western-style healthcare, which we all practice in the private sector amongst the upper middle class and rich, it's Western-style, it's dominated by highly specialized medicine. So we have subspecialists, cardiologists, pulmonologists, urologists, and, and now I heard that you've got 
specialists who only specialize in asthma, others who specialize in lung cancer. So now we've got subspecialists or subspecialists. That's how Western medicine is. So when you walk into a Western style medical practice, they put you in a compartment. You either got heart disease, and if you've got heart disease, is it cardiomyopathy? Is it coronary artery disease? You've got pulmonary disease, have you got airways disease or interstitial lung disease? And you get referred and you go to a specialist only who's an expert only in that. So you can't see the whole patient. It's highly costly and unfortunately inaccessible to the majority of the population. In the developing world, we have patients who present with multiple comorbidities. HIV is an example. HIV is not a disease of one organ, it's of all the organs. So the patient can present with TB, with uh, diarrhea, with skin rashes, with meningitis, you name it. So now you've got to have a doctor who specialized in the whole individual, in, able to manage it. You get somebody with malnutrition. Malnutrition manifests in many ways. But what's striking here is in both settings, both diseases, disease patterns we see are preventable with lifestyle management, infection control, etc. So you can see the, the problems we face uh, with medicine in an unjust world. Eh? Now when you look at South Africa, <coughs> the determinants of health in our country is multifactorial. So we are, we are the country with the greatest burden or the highest burden of HIV and AIDS than any other country in the world. <coughs> Excuse me. We currently have of our population of 54 million an estimated 7 million people living with HIV AIDS. We have the largest number of people on antiretroviral treatment than any other country in the world. We have TB. The TB incidence rate is about 800 per 100,000. It's come down from 1,000 per 100,000. That's the third largest TB incidence rate or TB burden country in the world. We have one of the largest incidences or prevalence of violence, <coughs> whether that is road accidents or, or, or murder, but that's South Africa. Then we have racial and gender-based uh, healthcare problems. Racial is determined by our apartheid past. <coughs> and then we have disease of lifestyle. Even amongst the poor, we're beginning to see large amounts of patients with diabetes, hypertension and obesity some of it driven by antiretroviral treatment. And then we have the last disease which nobody talked about and that is institutionalized corruption. And that unfortunately is a legacy of developing countries, particularly most countries in Africa. So it's a serious issue that we face and that impacts on healthcare delivery. So this is an example of <coughs> problems that we face in apartheid South Africa. So this is a, a lodging in the gold mines in the 1960s. Now you can see just part of the room where the miners lived during their shifts. And the gold mine had three shifts. Each room has about 15 in, uh, people staying in there. Every eight hours they change so that they could have cheap accommodation. So 45 people would be staying in one room per day, per 24 hour cycle. Now if one of them got flu, all of them would get it. If one of them got TB, all of them would get it. Now they've been removed from their homes, so for their pleasures they're going to seek the comforts of the local prostitutes, so then they would pick up transmissible diseases like syphilis, gonorrhea, and more recently HIV. Then they go back to visit their families in their homes during the holidays and they take the infectious diseases with them. So that's how HIV got into the rural areas. So you can see how South Africa was faced with a serious uh, sort of uh, conjunction of many factors. So when you look at the healthcare system in South Africa currently, we have the Department of Health which sets the national health policy like all other countries. We have nine provinces, each of them have their Department of Health, which then is accountable to the National Department of Health. And within the public sector, we have three tiers, primary, uh, well, district, regional and tertiary. Tertiary is where we have the specialized facilities. There's probably about one per province, but there are three provinces that do not have adequate tertiary facilities. The primary healthcare system, 
by design is primarily nurse driven and supposed to be cost effective but not accessible to the majority. The local government is responsible for preventative and promotive services such as vaccines, etc. Right. But when you look at the private healthcare system, we've got general practitioners, we've got private hospitals, and it's funded through health insurance. 70% of the private hospitals are found in three of the country's nine provinces, and 38% are located in the most uh, richest province, which is Houghton, where Johannesburg is. And I think most people who fly into South Africa would land at Johannesburg Airport, that is Oliver Tambo International Airport. So you can see the maldistribution of services. Okay? Now when you look at healthcare expenditure in, from the 10-year period in 2006, in blue is the healthcare expenditure in the public sector. What percentage of the population do you think that represents? 60%, 70%, 20 percent? 30%, okay? And look at the amount, sorry, 70 percent in blue, that's the public sector expenditure. But look at the largest amount of money in healthcare is spent in 30 percent of the population in the private sector. And in fact, over the next 10 years, the problem got even worse. So you can see this gross inequity in healthcare distribution. So 70% of the population has no health insurance and they totally depend on the state-funded service. And 30% have health insurance but consume 70% of the health care expenditure or account for 70% of the health care spend. So you can see this gross disparity <coughs> and anomaly. Okay? So I was involved in a Lancet series publication on health in South Africa and I wrote the, was co-author of the chapter on non-communicable diseases. And then five years later, the Lancet approached us to write a review of what happened five years later. What progress have we made? And when I looked at the article written, the manuscript drafted by my colleagues, I said that one thing that is missing in your assessment of what happened five years later is you fail to recognize institutional misgovernance or corruption that had led to a decay in the healthcare services. I said, we as doctors should not be apologists for the government. They refused to accept my position, so I withdrew my name as a co-author on that paper. This is the data from that paper, and I rest my case because it clearly shows that the financing, again, 43% of the finance goes to 70% of the population for healthcare. So clearly nothing's changed. So in fact, in the original paper, you can see how healthcare is, uh, meant or is determined. <clears throat> if you look at each of the provinces, you can see in red are all the proportions of people who live below the poverty line. So take any province, take Gauteng, which is the richest province, okay? One third, sorry, seven percent live below the poverty line. You take um, Eastern Cape, which is one of the poorest provinces, 30 percent live below the poverty line. And that's a country that's now about 20 years post-apartheid. And I can assure you that when you, I haven't had time to do it, but the recent uh, that figures suggest that that problem has actually gone worse. And we have to ask ourselves why. What are the leading causes of morbidity and risk for morbidity in South Africa? I mean, this is a long list, but I'll show you some of the things. HIV and AIDS, okay? interpersonal violence and injury, tuberculosis, road traffic injury, diarrheal diseases, lower respiratory tract infection, low birth weight. Now if you take those top five or six diseases, all of them are preventable with good healthcare delivery. Yet it's getting worse. The risk factors we have is unsafe sex, sexually transmitted infections, interpersonal violence, alcohol, tobacco, and obviously obesity. And that, unfortunately, we see a wave of non-communicable diseases that are characterized by diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and clearly, as I pointed out, about, at the moment, about the three to four million people who are long-term antiretroviral treatment are beginning to experience the metabolic complications and living longer and therefore presenting with all the so-called diseases of lifestyle. And then we have all our known risk factors which everyone else has, so it just adds to the problem. And in fact, the healthcare problems in South Africa 
can be defined as a collision of about four or five epi epidemics, HIV and TB, violence, malnutrition, uh, gender-based violence, and non-communicable diseases. Okay? Now let's see how well we did over a 10-year period or 15-year period. Okay. So if you look, let's take um, infant mortality. Hmm? We've not done very well over a 15-year period post-apartheid. Um, now look at the bottom slide. Today is World AIDS Day. So South Africa has got the worst HIV epidemic in the world. Okay? Now if you look at in the last 10 years, the prevalence rate of HIV has actually plateaued off. And in fact, our previous Minister of Health said that we're doing very well. It hasn't gone up. But if it went up any further, we would have a holocaust in our country. The reason it's plateaued out is because the number of people getting infected is equal to the number of people dying from HIV and AIDS. So effectively, we're getting a spurious belief that we got things under control. In fact, we are producing about 1,000 new HIV infections per day in South Africa. So you can see we haven't done well. So I spoke about institutional corruption. Now I don't know if any of you follow politics in South Africa. We're currently experiencing a serious problem which is characterized by the capture of state enterprises. Our president, I'm not saying anything that is um, uh, wrong. It's all in the, this I'm quoted from the newspaper excerpt. Okay. Now our president, Jacob Zuma, has been accused of working in collusion with one very big Indian family in South Africa called the Guptas. And they have been involved with actually trying to take over state enterprises such as electricity, water, um, uh, telephone and communications. And there's been an investigation by the public prote uh, protector. And the report confirms that South Africa's worst fear about corruption, that the state has been captured. In 355 pages, the former public protector and a team of investigators outline in detail just how much control this one family has over South Africa's resources, and they're not even South Africans. The Gupta's close friend, President Zuma, as well as two ministers implicated in the report, went to court to stop its release. That's how bad it is. Now, this is at the highest possible level. So you can understand, and I can tell you that this reflects the story of Africa, sorry to say. I think if you don't experience it here, consider yourself fortunate. And in fact, there is corruption all over the world. Nobody understands how Trump won the election, but they can afford it, we cannot. Okay, so what is South Africa doing? South Africa has now embarked on this ambitious program to provide a national health insurance. Remember I told you? 70% of the population do not have health insurance. Our current Minister of Health has proposed, I think he had a dream one night and he woke up and he said, we're going to have a national health insurance like Canada, like the NHS, and so everybody is going to have access to health care through insurance. So they set up pilot projects to see how the national health insurance would work because if everybody had health care insurance paid for by the government through taxpayers' money, then they can go to any institution and have health care. What happened? They developed a pilot project and it failed miserably. This has just been reported a week ago. Hospitals and clinics in South African government's flagship national health insurance pilot program are failing to improve any faster than those in the rest of the country. Over 200 million rand, that's about 15 million euros, have been wasted and they have not been able to deliver. So this government's grand plan for having a national health insurance is going to fail. And what's going to happen? About 1 billion rand, which is about 75 million US uh, euros, is going to go to waste. So I think the big picture in developing regions is inequity. Okay, there is a global imbalance. And I'm going to illustrate that very quickly. Okay, so inequity is where there is unfairness, discrimination, injustice, inequality, inequality, disproportion, and imbalance. Okay. How does this play out in a global access to essential medicine? So let's take essential medicine as one issue and see how we in developing countries uh, and, uh, have a problem. So if you look at patents for drugs, the first patent 
for a drug was 1790 in the US. Okay. Three types of patents. Uh, we have utility, design and plant patents. And universities, depending on material, fall into one of these categories. And in fact, the US law government protects this patent industry. Okay. So after World War II, we've had the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Much of the world policy created in regard to trade, patent and intellectual laws are created within the parameters of these institutions. So they control patents. And I'm talking about this because it impacts on drugs. Representation of the third world within the international forum is little or non-existent. Developing countries therefore as a consequence are at the womb of the first world. So if the first world decides we don't need to develop new TB drugs, then it won't happen. And in fact that's what happened. For 20 years we had no new TB drugs until we described XDR TB and then suddenly the World Health Organization woke up and said, hey, we need new TB drugs. So when they came to the party, suddenly overnight we have two new TB drugs. Why didn't we have it 20 years ago? Because it was not a first world problem. Why it was not a first world problem? Because as long as it doesn't affect them, they do not have a mandate to want to study it. So what about balance? Equal representation from each participant and it includes international policy, international institutions and organizations. Yet it is not upheld due to the complexity and definition of power between the needs of the first world and the monetary limitations of developing countries. So it is the power and the wealth of the first world that determines the agenda for what drugs are investigated and produced. Okay. So on an individual level and as a nation, the US policy pervades and affects the third world by two different interests from the same place. And remember, things are going to, we don't know how things are going to pan out with the Trump administration coming into power from January. We, got our, we, got our, we can only hope, but we are never sure what's going to happen. So the transnational cooperation and companies of the first world are governed by treaties and larger agreements of trade by the first world. Okay? Many of the first world companies have more capital investment and wealth than the, than the total budget of most developing countries. The power and influence of international policy, treaties, trade agreements and accepted policy represents or reflects that imbalance of power. So let me take HIV AIDS since today is World AIDS Day as an example. So when you look, when you redraw the map of the world according to the burden of HIV AIDS, you can see that Africa is bloated because that's where the greatest burden of HIV AIDS is, okay? So picture, remember that picture, okay? So when you look at mortality also, clearly, most people who die from HIV and AIDS would be in the countries most affected, right? So when you look at where the resources to deal with HIV AIDS, it's not where the greatest burden of disease is, it is in the first world, okay? So do you, can you get the picture now? What about the pharmaceutical industry's market share by region? Hmm? Can you see that Europe and North America have about 87% of the market share of drugs and the rest of the world that has the greatest burden of diseases only carries about 13% of the market share. So you can begin to understand why health care in developing countries is health in an unjust world, okay? So affordable medicines, so again proportional to percentage of population with access to, uh, to essential drugs, you can see again that the developing regions are most disadvantaged, okay? So you can see that even if you look at drugs alone, that the agenda for drugs is dictated by big pharma which are, have, are, are, are vested in first world. And until such time that the developing world has a voice and can stand up and demand that its health care priorities are addressed, that price fixing is uh, opposed so that drugs are made freely accessible and our First Minister of Health uh, in our democratic South Africa stood up against major pharma and won the battle of the patent against antiretroviral drugs. And then as a consequence, uh, drug industry pharma like Supply in India were able to produce antiretroviral drugs so that
patients can get antiretroviral drugs for $10 a month. Previously it was more like $100 to $200 a month. So you can see that once the first, the developing world is able to express itself and stand up for its right, then access to healthcare then improves. Okay? I'm not, I mean, in the interest of time, there's also an issue about uh, science. So, where is the agenda for research being set? So, when you look at HIV AIDS and you look at publications, you would see that the vast majority of publications come from the first world where there is the least burden of disease. Moreover, even if the study is done in developing countries, the research is led by the developed world. So, what HIV AIDS has done is has created uh, jobs for academics and researchers from the first world. Now, that might not be a bad thing because if we're not doing it for ourselves, then somebody has to do it. But what it is saying is that even in this modern world of telecommunication and we are all connected, we are still not being able to empower ourselves to do what's important for us. We, are, we remain subservient to the wounds of the first world. Okay? So what about health? Is health the right? I think we all would agree, but it seems like it's more a commodity. Capitalism and business, does that mean that millions of people should suffer from curable diseases? And I showed you that most of the diseases that affect South Africa are preventable or curable. Okay? So the lack of monetary and political power within the third world means that we have no say in the justice of international trade agreements such as TRIPS. Okay? So I think the answer to the question of whether health is a right or a commodity is easily answered. Firstly, we all believe philosophically that health is a right. But the way health is practiced and health care is delivered, it is a commodity. So if you are rich, even living in the poorest country, you can buy the best health care in the world. And if you are poor, you are left to your own devices and you probably survive if you're lucky and if you don't, tough. Okay, so what's the solution? The third world needs to exercise certain essential patents to produce medicines, either in the first world at wholesale or develop it in the, in the country of greatest need. Okay? I'm not going to waste too much time with this because I think it's saying the same thing. Now, this is a statement that's made by Professor Jerry Kovade in the article in The Lancet and what he said is that freely elected governments are the minimum condition for effective health policies. That's what South Africa had in 1994. The health and social consequences of despotic, unelected or poorly functioning elected governments can be long-lasting. We've seen that in Zimbabwe and we're beginning to see that in South Africa. The will of the people expressed through resistance to oppression or mobilization against failed policies in democracies is the best investment for a healthy future. Now unfortunately that's what we did in South Africa and from 1994, 22 years later, we've not achieved that. In fact, we've gone backwards. Okay? So you can look at that. We have all the elements in place in South Africa, but we failed to achieve that. And unfortunately, when Trump says make America great again, we could paraphrase that by saying let's continue screwing the developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very impressive uh, talk. Uh, maybe you can stay here. Uh, I don't know if there are questions in the cell. Um, so at the end, you are very pessimistic for the future, the near future. No, I'm not pessimistic. I think we have a responsibility as leaders, as academics, as doctors, to actually express the problem so that we can deal with it. If we remain in denial, then it's not going to be addressed. And I think as, as, as healthcare professionals, generally we fail the people because we've looked at our own self-interest as a profession and not looked at the bigger picture. And I think it's a wake-up call for all of us around the world to advocate for healthcare of our, the population that we serve. Doctors historically are held in high esteem by society and I think we cannot uh, let them down. And so I am being deliberately provocative, deliberately pessimistic so that 
we know what our responsibilities are. No, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Clearly, the, your concern is that the drug side effect, but the lack of drug. But Absolutely, because everything we practice in medicine ends up with a prescription. And if that prescription costs too much, then we're in trouble. And on the other hand, we may be over-prescribing as well, so we need a balance. Question que je pose en français, parce que je ne suis pas assez doué en langue étrangère. Est-ce que, est -ce que euh, sur le plan épidémiologique, la médecine, par exemple la médecine chinoise, euh, montre qu'elle peut avoir des supériorités euh, par rapport à la médecine occidentale So you're talking about Chinese medical practice? Yes. Yeah. Well, you see, the thing is, it's not been researched. The same thing applies to Ayurvedic medicine from India. We don't have the same uh, paradigm of Western science applied to those treatments. So we can't criticize it, nor can we embrace it until we have the information. So I don't, certainly, I mean, I'm brought up in a um, Western-style medical training and believe in the scientific process to evaluate efficacy of various interventions. Now, we can't comment on it until we have the information and I think the challenge is for these countries that have these health care um, programs or treatments to be investigated within a Western paradigm so we can accept it with confidence. At the moment, we cannot.